begin reading this morning in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, we read, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Uh, we see here in these three verses that the need for the gospel is to make us righteous. Uh, the gospel is available to anyone of any, any uh, creed, anyone of any ethnic background, anyone from uh, of any different uh, culture. Uh, the gospel is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew or to the Greek today. For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, but the wrath of God, in contrast, will be revealed to anyone uh, who uh, is ungodly or unrighteous, who holds the truth, has the truth, and still has it in unrighteousness. In other words, they, they have the availability to the gospel. Maybe they've heard it often. Maybe they've heard it a few times. But then instead of trusting the gospel for their salvation, they, maybe they decide, well, I'm just going to take my chances and try to face God on my own without trusting Christ died for my sins. But the Bible's clear in the first three chapters of Romans that there are consequences to die without faith, without faith in what Christ did on the cross as the only payment for our sins. And so in chapter 3 of the book of Romans, uh, in verse 10, uh, we read, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. So why do we need to trust the gospel? Because in the gospel, uh, it's the power of God unto salvation because it, the righteousness of God is revealed to us in the gospel. And we need that because there's none of us that are righteous, no, not one. If you drop down to verse 21, the, verse that, uh, the passage says, but now, talking about during the beginning with the ministry of the Apostle Paul, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. We need the righteousness of God. The law could only bring condemnation to us. The law was given uh, to the Jews back with Moses, and it demonstrated to the world that all are sinners and needed to trust God. Uh, now today, uh, the law still uh, is available. We can, we can read it. God has published his word. The, the, the law program is recorded in the Old Testament. We still have the Ten Commandments. We're all familiar with it. The law, according to verse 19, but now we know whatsoever things the law saith, that saith to them who are under the law, why? Why was the law given? That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, verse 20, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So God gave the law as his perfect standard of righteousness that all men will be measured by. Men, women, and children uh, will be judged according to God's perfect standard of holiness or righteousness. To always do that which is right. We can't live up to that standard, so God intervened and sent his son to go to the cross to be our redeemer, to pay the ransom for our sins. And we've been talking about this, uh, this truth about the doctrines of salvation. The book of Romans was given, uh, it begins by Paul explaining to the Romans that he wrote the letter or epistle to the Roman churches to establish them in the doctrines of faith. So the first thing Paul begins in establishing these believers is to explain the truths of salvation, uh, specifically justification by grace through faith alone. It's so important for new believers who've trusted that Christ died for their sins to understand why they're saved. Because it's that understanding, understanding that God paid for our salvation. It's, our salvation is the work of God accomplished at Calvary so that God can give it as a free gift to us. That's so important to understand because that's the only way you can know that you have eternal life when you die. Heaven will be your home. That's the way you know that all your sins are forgiven when you've trusted Christ died to pay for your sins. That's, we call that assurance of salvation or, or eternal security. 
The only way that's possible is to understand that salvation is the work of God upon us. <clears throat> a lot of times religion confuses salvation with sanctification, the walk of the believer. <clears throat> we'll look at a passage in Titus uh, this morning that demonstrates that salvation is what God does for us. And the walk of the believer is what God has in mind that we would have a desire to do good works out of thanksgiving and gratitude, motivated by grace. That's when the only time God can accept our good works uh, and up to service and please and honor Him is after we're saved. If we're not saved, if we're trying to perform good works to earn our salvation, that's an offense to Almighty God. So that's the difference between a lot of what religion teaches about salvation and what the Bible says is true according to Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon. Salvation is by grace through faith alone. And that's why we're studying this, this gospel message because it's how we're established. So turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 6, verse 23. In Romans 6, 23, hold your place there, Romans 6, 23. And uh, we're going to continue reading in, in chapter 3 of Romans. Um, we read <clears throat> verse 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation and all-satisfying sacrifice through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness, Christ's righteousness, for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, Christ's righteousness, that He might be just, God might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So this short, these few verses here explain to us there's the sin problem, then there's the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross that makes it possible for God to make righteous a believer who trusts that Christ died for their sins. Our salvation is free to us, to us but it costs a great price. And the price was Christ's own precious blood on the cross of Calvary. <coughs> so, last time we were studying about our redemption. Um, verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption means freedom by the payment of a price. When I was a kid, I told the story last time that we used to collect empty Coke bottles. And back when I was a kid, there were, there were glass and you could take those empty bottles and redeem them at the store. You could give money for them. <coughs> um, we use the, the term redemption in a modern, uh, modern usage. We talk about if somebody does something wrong or somebody does something that is disappointing, that if they do something good, they can redeem themselves for the bad thing that they did or the wrong thing that they did. That's a, the use of the term redemption. They've redeemed themselves. They've done something to purchase and undo the bad thing that they did. That's the idea. Redemption, as far as the doctrine in the Bible, is freedom by the payment of a price. So redemption, the Bible mentions the word, but if you don't connect, when you read the word redemption, the, the price that Christ had to pay, pay to purchase or redeem us from our sins then the doctrine doesn't have any meaning. When you understand that, you begin to be established in the truth and understanding that the reason that you're saved when you trust Christ died for your sins is that God, you understand that God accomplished a work on the cross to save you. And the reason why you're saved is it wasn't something you did, but it was something God did on your behalf for you. And your salvation doesn't require you to perform something to accomplish your salvation, but God performed it when he died to pay for the sins of all men. But salvation, to receive the benefit of what Christ did, a lot of people know that Christ died on the cross, but a lot of people will die because they haven't put their trust 
their personal trust in what Christ did as a payment for their own sins. And that's salvation. Trusting in what he did to be able to receive the gift of eternal life from God. Knowing that, realizing that you couldn't pay for your own salvation, you had to receive it as a gift from God. And we, we talked about a gift, and we talked about how to receive a gift. Uh, the, the, to receive a gift, we understand the gift principle. When someone gives you a present, you don't have to pay them for the present. Once you've received it, it's, you know, thinking about it, maybe a birthday present or a package is, is wrapped up and given to you. You receive it, you unwrap it, and you know that what they gave you is yours without payment. That's how you receive salvation from God. It's a free gift. Romans 6.23, if you're still there, Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. There are consequences for our sin. We're born with a sin nature. We, we are sinners. Be, uh, we aren't sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners when we're born with a sin nature. But the good news is, Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. <clears throat> but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Salvation is a gift from God. That's why the word grace is used in Romans 3.24, being justified freely by His grace. Grace is God's righteousness at Christ's expense through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The expense was paid for on the cross. If you'll go to 1 Timothy chapter 2 with me. <coughs> Sorry. Excuse me. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and look at verse 5. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. Redemption, freedom by the payment of a price. This doctrine of redemption is, is explained here in this passage. Um, 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Now, the important thing is Christ gave himself on the cross. A lot of times you watch a TV documentary about how it happened. It's a horrible event to watch unfold, the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But you have to appreciate and understand, he, is, he was God in the flesh. If he didn't want to have his, the crucifixion accomplished, he could have just thought, and the, those that were trying to harm him and, and crucify him would have been, their lives would have been taken from him immediately. He could have just thought, and the angels of heaven would have delivered him. He went there deliberately, on purpose, to pay for our sins, the only way that they could be paid for by his life being laid down for his creation. So, he, the verse says, he gave himself, uh, in verse 6, he gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Now, the most important thing about learning our salvation is that part of it. That salvation isn't free. It costs God everything. It's only freely given to us by God's grace because there was no way else to give us salvation. It couldn't be earned, purchased. No good works we could do could, could be rewarded with salvation. We had to simply receive it as a free gift from God. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Ephesians 1, 7. This verse says, in whom, talking about in the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now, redemption, again, freedom by the payment of a price, through his blood, the price that was paid, according to the riches of his grace. God richly bestowed eternal life and his righteousness. The hope that we have for a resurrection body is something God desired to give to us. He gave life, if you think about it, to Adam and Eve uh, as our great-great-grandparents so that we might all have life. That was given to us freely. But God knew when he created Adam and Eve that they would make a bad choice and that the sin nature would 
they would receive the wages of their sin. Death would come upon all men. And that all would be born with a sin nature and, and need a Savior. God, before God created, he understood he would also have to die for his creation. That was part of God's plan. It, God's plan wasn't that any get sick or die, but God's plan was to offer redemption if man used his free will to make bad choices, which we all have. Galatians chapter 4. Go with me to Galatians 4. Talking about redemption, the, the meaning of, of that doctrine that's attached to our salvation, the redemptive work of Christ. Galatians chapter 4 now. Verse 4. But when the faithfulness of, or excuse me, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. See the whole, the terminology, you can't miss it. How do you receive a gift? You just accept it. A gift is received, it's not wages paid to you. Uh, again, verse 5. To redeem them that were, that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, an heir of God through Christ. In trusting the gospel, God the Holy Spirit places you in Christ. He takes your spiritual nature, identifies it with, with Christ's spiritual nature, and therefore Christ's righteousness is imputed to you. It's applied to your account. It's a spiritual process. You don't feel it when you trust the gospel. You don't feel the Holy Spirit identifying you together with Christ. But it's how it is that God could call you a son here in this passage. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Who because of his perfect righteousness, because he came as our Redeemer and he was raised from the dead, the resurrection is proof that all of our sins were paid for. God could not have raised when he put the sins of the world upon his Son. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He being righteous, he didn't know any sin until he was made sin on the cross. But once our sins were put upon him, for him to be raised again meant all of our sins had to been paid in full. It's the receipt, if you will, or proof that our, that our salvation has, our redemption has been accomplished, that the ransom was accepted by God Almighty. Isaiah 53 says, It pleased the Lord God Almighty to bruise him, his son, on the cross, to make him our sin for us. It pleased him. It satisfied his righteousness. Like we said, that, that term in, in Romans 3, propitiation, all satisfying sacrifice. It satisfied God. It pleased him. And so he was able to raise him from the dead. His resurrection that was witnessed in 1 Corinthians 15 by 500 people of his, 500 of the Lord's disciples or followers saw him in resurrection at one time. He was here 40 days uh, with his, visiting his disciples on several occasions, eating with them to demonstrate his resurrection life. And that is the proof of our salvation. Um, look at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, that's at the end of Paul's epistles, uh, before Hebrews, the book of Titus is after Timothy and Thessalonians. Um, <clears throat> Titus 2 verse 11, for the grace of God, again, God's righteousness at Christ's expense, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, but it teaches us something. That's why we learn about it, teaching us that desire, that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live, not that we always will without a failure, but that we should, we should live soberly. That means not being carried away in drunkenness of our emotions. We should be sober, thinking people, righteously, trying to do what's right, and godly, having God in our thinking. Ungodliness is not having God in your thinking. Godliness is letting this book fill your mind and renew your mind and influence you. Godly in this present evil world, in this present world. Lifetime in our flesh and our bodies after we're saved. Verse 13, we have a hope. 
looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We put it on the chart here at the rapture that precedes that time of wrath and judgment Vance was talking about in Sunday school this morning. We're looking for that blessed hope in the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice verse 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. How much iniquity? All iniquity. And purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. So redemption has to, to do, do with our sins being forgiven because all of our sins were paid for through the redemptive work of Christ. How many times is Christ going to go to the cross to pay for our sins? He went once. It's not going to happen again. The next time the Lord Jesus Christ comes, according to the book of Revelation, he's going to have a sword going out of his mouth. It's going to be a time of judgment upon the world. They're not going to be able to touch or harm him. Again, when he went to the cross here, it was deliberately. He didn't fight. He didn't struggle. He allowed them to crucify him because he went there on purpose. The verse in Timothy says, that Christ came into the world for a purpose. He came into the world to save sinners. And so he accomplished that. Next time he comes back, he's going to be coming back as the judge and the king. Uh, go with me to Galatians chapter 3 now. Galatians 3. We're skipping through a lot of verses here. Galatians 3, verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. A lot of ways the scriptures explain this doctrine of redemption is important because it's an understanding. Salvation wasn't something you could earn. It's something that God had to purchase for you. And the only way the creator of all things could redeem you and purchase you from your sins was to lay down his life on the cross. That's how much he loves you. That's why Romans 5, 8 says, God committed his love toward us and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. The gospel message in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4 says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Again, a lot of religions, they teach that Christ went to the cross and was crucified, and that he rose again. And then they also teach, and unfortunately they add works to the salvation process. They say you have to do these religious rites or rituals in order to be saved, or uh, they, they say that you have to do good works and... and uh, continuing good works until the end of your lifetime in order to be saved. They don't recognize that the redemptive work of Christ on the cross is the only payment for sins and the only way to receive the benefit of what Christ did on the cross is to simply receive it by faith alone. Um, Ephesians, I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 and 9. Now, for the, most of you I know that you're saved, and I have no question about your salvation. But again, this is information to establish us in the doctrines of faith. Uh, so I'm going over these things. Bear with me. Verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That there's no verse any clearer to that, I mean, than that verse about salvation is a gift from God. It's not of works. You can't work to receive a gift. When you, when you pay somebody for a gift, it's not a gift anymore. It's, a, it's something you purchased. Now look at verse 13 of chapter 1. Chapter 1 of Ephesians, verse 13. Talking about how you receive that gift. In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, Christ died for your sins, in whom Christ also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So Vance mentioned this morning, being 
placed in Christ and sealed there by God the Holy Spirit, comparing that to sealing vegetables, the process of canning vegetables. The seal is what keeps you in Christ. The seal is God the Holy Spirit. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, Romans chapter 8, because God the Holy Spirit is what put you in Christ and seals us there. The reason why you know you're eternally secure in Christ is because nothing can take you out of Christ. And the only thing that any condemnation, somebody could say, yet you're a sinner, and the one that you're sealed into paid for all of your sins. In Christ, you have his perfect righteousness. So it's not a matter of you maintaining good works to keep salvation, because you never did a good work to get saved. You simply trusted in Christ, and the work of God is identifying you with Christ and sealing you in Christ. That's salvation. Uh, go with me to uh, um, Romans 3.24. We read that a few times this morning, so I'm just going to go directly from Romans 3.24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, to chapter 4, verse 1 of Romans. What shall we say then, that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath were of the glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now, to him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Again, contrasting works and reward with grace and getting a free gift. Works and reward uh, is a debt that your employer owes to you. Uh, he contrasts that. Not, to him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not... But believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Notice verse 7, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Now, to have God's righteousness given to you means that your sins are forgiven. Understanding redemption, that Again, your salvation was purchased by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. He paid for all of your sins at one point. When he died on the cross, all your sins were in the future. When you trust Christ died for your sins, you're placed in him. All your sins are paid for. You have his perfect righteousness. That means all your sins are forgiven. So understanding redemption is to understand forgiveness of sins. That's, again, assurance of salvation, eternal security. We're going to close with a few verses. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. We looked at this earlier. Notice again, the redemption and the forgiveness of sins in one verse. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. We have the forgiveness of sins. It's not something we have to pray for every day to stay current or keep. It's something that we have because of our redemption. That the way we receive our redemption, the gift of God, is by trusting Christ died for our sins. To have this moment we can save. So once you're saved, you're redeemed, you have the forgiveness of sins. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 14. You see, these doctrines all tie together. And that's why we're established in these doctrines on a layer, Paul lays layer upon layer upon layer. This doctrine, redemption, ties with the understanding of the forgiveness of sins. Colossians chapter 1 verse 14 says that it's much like Ephesians 1 7 did. In whom Christ we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Look at uh, Colossians 2 13 now, uh, the next chapter of Colossians. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of his flesh and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses. You can only be forgiven all trespasses once. You don't have to keep repenting of your sins to be forgiven. The moment you trust Christ died for your sins, you are forgiven all trespasses. So now that your sins are paid for and you're forgiven by the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
God's free to give you his perfect right.